Hello, my name is Brian Hall and welcome to CE Wire 2019. I'll be speaking about neuro-ophthalmology and systemic disease. I'll be presenting several patients in a Grand Rounds format that I hope you find enjoyable, interesting, and educational. I have no disclosures. Now, systemic disease and its treatments can produce a number of neuroophthalmic manifestations. These visual complaints will cause the patient to seek eye care, and when the etiology of their complaint isn't obvious, or when they're having multiple medical symptoms that are seemingly unrelated, we have to be the detectives who put the pieces together to solve the puzzle and make the diagnosis. This requires us to step back, look at the big picture, while paying attention to the details and sometimes look at the facts a little bit differently. Now, who better to give us advice than the greatest observer and detective of all time? I'd like to start off with a story about Mr. Holmes, written by Thomas Cathcart in his philosophy book, Plato and Platypus Walk Into a Bar. Holmes and Watson are on, the middle of, are on a camping trip. In the middle of the night, Holmes wakes up and gives Dr. Watson a nudge. Watson, he says. Look up in the sky and tell me what you see. I see millions of stars, Holmes, says Watson. And what do you conclude from that, Watson? Watson thinks for a moment. Well, he says, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Theologically, I see that God is all-powerful and we are small and insignificant. Uh, what does it tell you, Holmes? Watson, you idiot! Someone has stolen our tent! So as you can see, we often have to sometimes look at the fine details and see things others don't, while oftentimes stepping back and looking at the big picture, where if someone pays too much attention to the small details, they miss the obvious. Now, part of the reason why we look at things a little differently is that the integration of neurology and eye care is a relatively new compared to other subspecialties. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgical procedures known, and first documented in Sanskrit manuscripts in the 5th century BC. The ancient Greeks treated infections, and as late as the 1800s, we did not understand eye movements, and we didn't even think the cerebral cortex had any role in our perception. Now, this changed during World War I, which produced a large number of missile wounds to the brain. Sir Gordon Holmes was a British neurologist for the British Expeditionary Forces. He was stationed at a field hospital, which gave him the opportunity to investigate the effects of these missile lesions in specific regions of the brain on vision, balance, and bladder function. Harry Moss Trancare was a Scottish ophthalmologist who did extensive work and established recommendations and standards for clinical perimetry and established the definitions for several scotomas. Their study yielded a complete topographical map of the visual field in the primary cortical vision center, and it's the basis of our modern interpretation for visual fields. Then in 1947, Dr. Frank Walsh published his landmark text, which created the specialty of neuro-ophthalmology. The two most common complaints of a patient with neuro-ophthalmic disease is diplopia and vision loss. Polyplopia refers to the perception of more than two images, and this is often a monocular phenomenon caused by refractive aberrations. The exact incidence of double vision in the United States is unknown, but a study done at an eye hospital in London found that it accounted for approximately 1.4% of the presenting cases. Now, I don't know about you, it might just be selection of the sorts of patients that make it to our chairs, but I find that much more than 1.4% of my patients complain of double vision. Now, whether it's true double vision or not does vary, but there's definitely greater than a 1% rate, I find, in my practice. Now, 
sudden vision loss is very difficult to find out how often it happens because if it occurs in just one eye, as we all know, it may not happen. You've had that patient who had, did not realize they didn't see well out of one eye until they covered the other one during visual acuity check testing. Now, when the visual loss is sudden and painless, Ischemia should be at the top of your list of this cause. However, you do still have to rule out infection, inflammation, trauma, and compression. Once the entire exam is complete, if you find absolutely no organic cause for the vision loss, you also have to consider functional vision loss, where there's absolutely nothing organic or, or physiologic to be seen causing the vision loss. So let's start off with one with my case presentation. This is a 62-year-old white female who presented on November 28th complaining of a cloud over her vision in, the right, in her right eye. Now she had had cataract surgery with one of my colleagues back in September, following which her best corrected vi or uncorrected visual acuity was 2020. Then over the Thanksgiving holiday she had family visiting when she noticed an ink splot sort of in the vision of her right eye. She didn't see care immediately because of her family visiting, but once they left, she came in and saw my colleague saying that she wasn't seeing as clearly as she had been. When he looked in, saw her nerves, he sent her over to me the same day for evaluation. Now, she does have a medical history of hypertension, prediabetes, sleep apnea, hypercholesterolemia, and she had a blood clot in her right leg about a decade earlier. Her uncorrected visual acuity was counting fingers at one foot in the right eye and 20-25 in the left. I was unable to assess her pupils since she had already been dilated by my colleague. Her posterior chamber and trocular lens was clear and in place. Uh -huh. Pressures were 16 and 17. And here are her optic nerves. The optic nerve of the right eye shows pallid edema with superficial retinal hemorrhages. If you look carefully at the left optic nerve, it is small. However, it is also slightly edematous. Automated visual field testing in the right eye shows a superior depression and a central sequel defect. Visual field in the left eye shows a subtle superior depression, but it is relatively full. Based on these findings, I wanted to rule out an arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. We also had to rule out an non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, as well as an infectious, inflammatory, or infiltrative etiology. She denied any other rheumatologic or neurologic symptoms, and she didn't even realize there was anything going on in her left eye at all. So to the right there, you see the prescription I wrote for blood work. Now, if you don't write a ton of blood work and you need emergent blood work, it's very important to write stat results across the top like I did there. This was the actual prescription pad I sent to the emergency room with the patient. And I wanted to rule out, again, anything inflammatory, infectious, or ischemic. I ordered uh, immediate, the immediate blood work, and I asked for them to do a possible temporal artery biopsy based on these blood work results. I tentatively scheduled for her to return in 24 hours for follow-up, a pupil check, and a blood work review. That night, I received a call from the attending in the emergency room stating that, although he didn't know what the numbers were, the blood work was not supportive of giant cell arteritis. The results would be faxed to my office, and the patient had left the office against medical advice after the blood was drawn. We do have to remember she had come in much earlier in the day, initially saw my colleague, was then sent to me, and then I was sent to the emergency room. So it's sort of understandable why she was anxious to get home. I called the patient, I advised her of the blood work results, and then to follow up with me as scheduled tomorrow. At that next visit, her visual acuity was 2400 and was maintaining at 2025 in the left eye. She did have an afferent pupillary defect in the right eye. Pressures were 20 and 18, and all other exam findings were stable. I still had not received anything from the emergency room. My leading differential at the time was a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy due to her multiple vasculopathic risks of a small crowded optic nerve, hypertension, prediabetes, 
and sleep apnea. However, I still had to rule out a space occupying lesion, other inflammatory or infectious etiologies. I ordered an MRI of her brain with and without contrast, an MRI of her head to rule out a venous sinus thrombosis. I prescribed bromonidine three times a day in both eyes in the event that this was a non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in an effort to lower her eye pressure, hoping to increase the blood perfusion to her optic nerve head. I asked the front desk to follow up for the blood work results and I asked for her to come back in two weeks. Now she was one of those patients that when I got home, something about it just kept on eating at me. And that's what that little swirl is. A swirl is me thinking. Something not sitting right with me. And I was like, you know, I never actually received the blood work results from the emergency room, and I really wanted to look at those numbers myself. So the next day, I asked the front desk to follow up again, and over to the right is the blood work results I received from the emergency room. Now, that's not just a poor scan quality. That's actually the, 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 the facts that came through. Um, but if you look real closely, you can see that her complete blood cell count was unremarkable. Her SED rate was 37, and her C-reactive protein was 6.5. Now, is this normal? Well, based on lab values, that is an elevated SED rate. Now, if you do the calculation, she's 62 years old, you add 10, divide by 2, that's 36, not all that elevated. But you can get burned on that sometimes, because if you don't go with the lab values and everything else is pointing towards joint cell arteritis, that could be indicative. Now, oftentimes people expect SED rates to be in the hundreds or very, very elevated with this. Yes, that's when the diagnosis is clear cut and simple. The more subtle diagnoses or the more challenging ones, it may not be that elevated. Now, a normal C reactive protein is less than three. So now we have both an elevated, although subtle, SED rate and an elevated CRP. I don't think that's normal. So in light of the clinical findings that I was seeing, I was very suspicious for giant cell arteritis. I initiated prednisone 60 milligrams by mouth daily. I scheduled a vascular consult for a temporal artery biopsy, and I scheduled a rheumatology consult. Now giant cell arteritis is the most common primary vasculitis in adults, in, in particular people over the age of 50 with a peak of people in their eighth decade of life. It has its highest incidence in people of northern European descent, and women are more often to be affected than men. The classic symptoms we're all aware of, the headache, jaw claudication, scalp tenderness. Now, over 60, up to 60% of them present with vision loss, even transient vision loss as a presenting symptom, and 40% have polymyalgia rheumatica. Now, although these are the classic symptoms, oftentimes the patients I've caught with giant cell arteritis, they don't come in saying that it hurts when they brush their hair or when they chew. They have very nonspecific, discrete symptoms that you can't have a very difficult time pinning to one thing. These patients have often felt this way for quite some time, and they have a hard time verbalizing exactly what doesn't feel right. And those are the patients that I kind of have really raised my level of suspicion for giant cell arteritis, and I've developed a relatively low threshold to at least order blood work for them. The classic ocular finding in giant cell arteritis is an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy due to occlusion of the posterior ciliary arteries or ischemia of the choroid posterior optic nerve and retina. Now, when the patients come in, over half of them have very poor vision of counting fingers or worse. Over fi up to 50% of them are going to have bilateral involvement if it's not diagnosed promptly and treated immediately. 44% of them have complaints of transient vision loss, and a quarter of them have vision complaints alone. So again, this is something to keep in mind that when you have the patients with these transient vision loss symptoms and some other funny symptoms over the age of 50, Remember to keep giant cell arteritis on your differential list. So you want to work these patients up based on their history, their medical history, as well as your clinical examination. When you order blood work, you want to get a complete blood cell count with differential 
a sed rate. Now, you never want to order a sed rate without a complete blood cell count. Remember, the sed rates are ratios of white blood cells to red blood cells. So if you have a patient who is anemic, you may have a false positive and an elevated ESR when it's really not because their white cells are elevated, it's because their red blood cell count is low. You also want to order a C-reactive protein. When you look at a C-reactive protein together with a sed rate, when they're both elevated, that's 19.